Testing Mike. I'm the new cable TV intern. What's your name? Faith Knight. All right. I'm sorry. First name? Faith Knight. Oh, nice to meet you. New intern. Yeah. Uh, Welcome to the lawyer. Yeah. Thank you. All right. We got a second. I'm good. I think probably uh, just we're good to. Do you want a table? We can set a table up. Yeah. We can table. set a table up. Yeah, I think a table is Hopefully, you can get it more than me. Um, you know, you want to turn Uh, welcome to the Thursday, April 6, 2017 meeting of the Ordinance Committee. Uh, in attendance is Will Rowan and myself, William Donovan. And so we have a quorum. Uh, and uh, first item of business is approval of the minutes of March 2, 2017. I move approval. Second. Any changes? Did you see any changes? No, I didn't either. All in favor? Aye. Discussion on consumer fireworks and taking possible action on that. Let me, uh, we've got a couple of things that we want to deal with in this. Uh, the first is to identify uh, things that were updated in the uh, uh, draft ordinance that was before us uh, last month uh, uh, so that people understand where we are uh, who are interested in the fireworks issue. So I'm going to go over those. And we have both the fire and police chief with us today. Uh, and we will, uh, 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 both could not make last month's meeting, and so we uh, pushed to this meeting the opportunity to discuss with them 
the best ways to conduct a permitting process. So we'll get to that in a minute. Um, uh, the changes <coughs> that are now in the draft are to uh, strike the date of June the 5th, which would leave uh, the uh, allowable dates as June 3rd and 4th, uh, or July 3rd and 4th, excuse me, uh, strike July the 5th, and December 31st and January 1st. All hours moved to uh, uh, finishing fireworks at 10 p.m. Uh, we've added a section <coughs> that says that uh, enforcement of this uh, ordinance will uh, place an obligation upon the owners of property on which illegal use of fireworks occurs so that the owner uh, uh, can receive a ticket. Um, we have added a notice requirement whereby uh, Scarborough retailers of consumer fireworks are responsible for issuing a notification that there is a permit process for anyone who's purchasing fireworks for the purpose of uh, setting them off in Scarborough. Uh, we have added a uh, permit application process uh, uh, to the ordinance uh, and a respect your neighbor uh, uh, program which uh, the uh, uh, permit application requires uh, a person to uh, acknowledge they've read it, they understand it, uh, and they agree to it. Uh, the uh, provisions uh, of note in the uh, permit process are that, uh, and I'll read just the ones that I think are, 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 are material uh, and not just uh, basic information, uh, that uh, uh, if the location uh, uh, of the application is other than the property owned by me, I have permission of the owner uh, of the property to set up the fireworks. I have liability insurance for any bodily injury or property damage that may result from fireworks, fireworks use allowed by this permit. <clears throat> I have read the respect your neighbor guidelines of the town of Scarborough attached here to and agree to follow its terms. And the <clears throat> uh, guidelines state, uh, uh, and I'll uh, do not use fireworks after 10 p.m., that's the new uh, limitation on time. Uh, do not use fireworks in any way that could unreasonably disturb your neighbor's comfort and repose or infringe upon your neighbor's safety or peaceful enjoyment of their property. Uh, inform your neighbors in advance where and when you are planning to use fireworks. Do not use fireworks near animals or livestock that may become frightened. We have added one. This is through uh, suggestions that were made between meetings uh, uh, by members of the uh, Ordinance Committee, uh, and it reads, only set off fireworks in areas where no fireworks debris will fall on your neighbor's property or any environmentally sensitive areas such as beaches, marshes, or wetlands. Uh, it finishes with, do not permit anyone under the age of 21 to use fireworks and carefully follow the safety instructions provided by the seller of the fireworks. So those, that is the uh, 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 series of amendments that are being proposed. Uh, and uh, I think probably what I'd like to ask is the chiefs to come up to the table uh, and let's talk about uh, the uh, permit process. Thank you both. Uh, Thank you. Appreciate uh, your coming. And, uh, and uh, really just like to have a discussion amongst uh, uh, the four of us, plus Tom, uh, about uh, uh, how to best uh, employ this uh, license uh, permit process. Uh, I'm sure you've probably given some thoughts, so I'm going to throw it over to you and let you kind of give us, give us your thoughts. Well, a lot of it is in enforceability. <laughs> I think I'll defer to you for the first, yeah, okay. first crack. Um, we, ha we do have some concerns about the enforceability of it and um, for a, a few different reasons. Um, first of all, you know, it's what we generally get with these situations is that somebody starts setting them off. Oftentimes they don't set them off for a, a long period of time. 
but people are out having their little bonfire or whatever they're doing and and uh somebody decides they're going to uh, they're going to light them off and they do and then we get the complaints and by the time we get down there uh, it's stopped and it's even if we find some people sitting around and debris and so forth it's it's uh, difficult for us to actually take an enforcement action and say we know that that was you doing. Um, the piece about the property ownership um, might be helpful to a certain degree, but I have questions about how that works, say with uh, with uh, rental properties and and uh, you know family gatherings where the maybe the homeowner isn't actually there. Uh, in terms of holding them responsible. Yeah, that's a good point. So I think there's going to be some difficulties with that piece of it. Um, you know, there was some discussion about could a neighbor call us and if they were willing to act as a witness, could we take an action? And that's quite possible. But what we have found with other similar situations like um, um, disorderly conduct and noise complaints and that kind of thing is that uh, oftentimes people will call us and because it's disturbing to them, but then when it comes to, well, are you willing to sign a complaint and, and write out a statement and so forth, they're not. So it leaves us kind of in a in this limbo stage where we are aware of it, can't really do a whole lot about it as, in terms of the enforcement piece of it. Um, as you read down through those, uh, I'm just you know reflecting on some of those things that uh, you know under the guidelines and so forth when you say so so let's say that somebody does come in and get a permit and so they're doing what we've asked them to do and they're doing it on the days that it's allowed and during the times that it's allowed but when you say that it can't be done in such a way that it disturbs or, or takes away from a neighbor's ability to enjoy their property that's that's pretty tough to because not everybody's going to view this the same, and any noise may disturb me in the enjoyment of my property. But if somebody next door is doing it during allowed times and they've got the permit and they're doing it in accordance with all the other rules, that's going to be a hard situation for us to be in the middle of judging whether that's really, you know. I mean, we, we, have, we have some people who will... Um, be a little bit taller of the neighbors. We have some people who absolutely <laughs> are not going to give an inch, and I just see us getting in the middle of some of these situations as to what's reasonable. Yeah, I, let's just talk about the, and the first part uh, where frequently you show up, and it's very difficult to make a clear determination that uh, a violation took place on this property or that property or. Uh, and whatnot. I think that is um, whether we did anything in this ordinance or not, any any change or not, has been the you know, the real difficult problem of yeah. uh, enforcing the fireworks ordinance. My guess is after uh, all is said and done, uh, you will still find it difficult mm -hmm. to uh, uh, to effectively enforce it. I think we're probably looking at some of these changes as being educational. Uh, as not, it, it's kind of like uh, South Portland has a, a organics program. They have no penalties associated with it. Right. Well, it's educational. That's really the intention of it. And in many respects, we want people to do what's right. C talk to your neighbor next door. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if they're a little bit concerned about the fireworks because you're letting them off right next to their house. Maybe you go to the other side where there's a vacant lot and right. just use some judgment. I think that's a, a lot of what we're trying to get to is to cause people to uh, uh, use better judgment. Uh, and I think that we do not expect that the police department is going to find their job made easier by these. You will be put in the middle of it. but. By virtue, it, it seems to me, and I know some of the times we've had some experiences where, where we've asked the police department to step in on noise mm -hmm. things, there's a Dutch uncle element to it. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and it's enormously effective because once it's brought to your attention that th there's a problem here, people do the right thing more often than not. And so uh, do I expect to see the number of tickets go up? No. Uh, I'd l I, I would think maybe that might happen as a consequence, but if it doesn't, that wouldn't bother me. It would be, it would be that we have a more informed public about what's right to do. Uh, there's limits on what we can probably do as long as we have a fireworks ordinance that allows consumer fireworks. The only other choice we have, in my view, beyond where we're trying to go to with these changes, is to ban them. Uh, and that, so those are, that's and my thought on enforcement, and I'll, I'll let Will. I guess I, I would say that the, <clears throat> in terms of the respect your neighbor guidelines, which includes the, um, you know, imposing upon your neighbor's comfort and repose, um, uh, I would suggest that that's not intended to be enforceable, um, that it's really um, intended to be part of the um, part of the permit and application to say that they've read it, yep. so that we're at least getting that information and it's really um, a suggested guideline at, at that point that it's not, uh, it shouldn't be a penalty associated with, That's right. with that component. Yeah, I think it's a, uh, uh, it's a good behavior guideline and we're setting these out uh, we're not trying to actually put them in the ordinance per se. They're, they're in an application form and saying, oh yeah, okay, uh, I agree with all those. I'll, I'll be happy to sign off on that. And, and I'm fine with that. And, and you know, we certainly can help with the education piece through our social media and through our VIPs and different things. I just didn't want to leave people with the impression that this is all going to somehow go away and it won't be a problem anymore because I, I'm not sure that that's going to... Th there's only one other thing that I wanted to mention and that is the, you know, sometimes these things have an unintended consequence and the situation being that the homeowner being held liable for somebody, and, and I'm, I'm not disagreeing with that, but I um, wonder at a situation like um, possibly Pine Point Beach or something like that where somebody ultimately ends up on a, 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 a transient, if you will, or a, a person just walking the beach or a group walking the beach ends up on somebody's property, um, I would hate to see that property owner be held responsible for something they have no control or desire to be a part of. And I've always thought that the, 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 uh, the greatest value a police officer can bring is good judgment and discretion as to what to proceed to enforce and when to simply explain the situation and, and, uh, and, and proceed on. So I think that is clearly one of those cases. Okay. Let me just add a couple of things if I could. I, um, first off, I applaud you for tackling this. It's, it's a difficult policy decision and, and don't by any means take any of the comments that we're making as, as negative towards the process. Uh, I have similar concerns about the enforceability and I, I think that part of maybe the way that you went down this was modeling it after the burn permit process and I just wanted to take a second to kind of compare and contrast that with what this is. Um, with the state burning permits, we're actually acting as an agent of the state. So we're not enforcing local ordinance. We are simply uh, an arm of the state inland fish and game folks, the forest wardens, uh, issuing these permits on behalf of them, which is codified in state law. So if there is a problem with that fire that somebody starts as part of their burning permit process, the state comes in and, and deals with that. They're the enforcement authority. It's not the local police that, that has to deal with it, uh, although they can, but they, they don't necessarily do that. And, and in those instances where we have a problem, that's our first call to the, the forest rangers and they come in and, and deal with it. And they have mechanisms for uh, restitution and you know taking care of the cost of suppression and all those things are, are taken care of. Um, in this case, it really is something different because now Chief Moulton's crew is enforcing this local ordinance. Um, and one of my concerns is are we in any way liable, the folks that are issuing the permits, if we're not out inspecting these or, you know, as an agent of the state, it's a little different 
than it is for doing it this way. So that's just something I wanted to toss out there. Um, I'm not sure what you envision as to who is going to issue those permits there or when we're going to do this. Um, right now, the complaints that we're getting, and we didn't speak to the statistics, but there, the volume of complaints that we handle for fireworks far exceed the dates when they're authorized. So most people are breaking the ordinance and now we're layering, layering an additional obligation to get a permit, it would be my assumption that only a small percentage of those people that are currently following the rules are going to apply for this permit. So it's, we're getting down into the weeds as to the effectiveness of the process. Um, but I'm, if you're intending for the fire department to do it, my question is, how many stations, what are the hours, because uh, at most of my stations, a a actually at all of the stations, I can't guarantee anybody there after the administrative staff leaves at 5 o'clock. Right. Mm -hmm. So if, if... And that's really part of why I wanted to have us have the discussion about the best way to do this. Uh, <clears throat> I, 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 Robbie, you had provided us with the statistics, and I saw how, I'd say probably... 75, 80% of all complaints were outside July 3rd, 4th, and 5th. And uh, I just think December 31, January 1st is almost a non-existent. No one does it until the <laughs> winter. Uh, uh, but it, to me, while we're, prob we're probably not going to be able to improve on those, because those are isolated incidents. August 27th, somebody lets a few fireworks off, you get a phone call, you log it, and, and you go. That, it's, to me, the concerns are that you're like in a war zone sometimes because the person down the street is legal, and they're letting them off left and right, and, they're, and, and it's driving them and their pets crazy. Uh, and, uh, and it goes for three straight days till 1 a.m. in the morning, 12.30 in the morning. And they know it's legal, so they don't call. Those aren't the right because those. What well, you get a formal complaint. Right. I what we were hearing back was <coughs> there is just a frustration with the high level of disruption that the program was causing by being too many days in the middle of the summer and too late at night. And I think that's really why we're 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 attacking where we are. Just, it's really the days shortened, hours shortened, education through the pr uh, permit process dramatically increased. Forced the, uh, uh, the retailers to actually notify people, so they can't say they didn't know. Uh, as I said, if, it, if, it, if we have no material improvement, then if the same level of concern exists that was expressed, and I think all the counselors heard it, uh, then I think we're going to ban them. Uh, so that, that's how I, <coughs> I, uh, I don't know if you have any comments on, on that part. Uh, uh, so I don't, I, I agree with you. The, the, it's, I'm not trying to, I don't think we're going to reduce the number of complaints outside of July 3rd, 4th, and 5th. So as far as stations and hours, I thought, it'd be good to just not have any preconceived notion of what's the best way to do it. Because uh, I could see it being, uh, you have 24-7 coverage. Uh, so if somebody says, oh, geez, tomorrow's the 3rd of July, and I just bought these fireworks, and it's 8 o'clock at night. Well, I can, I'm going from Phantom Fireworks back to my house, I'm going right by the police station, I can do it. But if it's, you know, 2 in the afternoon, and... I'm at uh, one of your stations, uh, and they live in that neighborhood. Well, that would be convenient too. So I didn't know whether or not having all of the fire station locations and the police station each have a stack of permits. As you can see, the pro it's not hard to fill out. Right. Pretty easy. Just you know, x a couple of boxes and fill in your name and sign it. Uh, you have to acknowledge that you've actually read the 
So I don't I know. So long as there's no extraordinary staffing requirements, we would issue them if staff's available, but we would not put staff on to be available necessarily. It, certainly at the fire bars. I, I guess that was the clarification I was looking for. It says the Scarborough Fire Department, Department, not Public Safety Dispatch, for example. Right. So I just wanted to make sure I was clear with your expectation. The way the draft is currently written, it says that the Scarborough Fire Department will issue that permit. Right. So is your expectation that that is only on those four days? And I think that there, what, you, what you can expect is that uh, uh, a week or two uh, uh, leading up to the 4th of July, you'll have uh, more than just a, a few. Uh, and so that'll be the, that's really when you have to sort of say, uh, how are you going to deal with that? Uh, but I think people will just have to stand and wait. Uh, there's, there's no provision for how uh, pretty time limit when they do that, right? I mean, they could come in that's right. Uh, June first, if they want to do, they can right, do uh, this, or they could come in. Come in, you know. They go, hey, well, we just talked about it. We're going to have a Fourth of July party. Got together over Christmas and talked about it. I'll go out and buy them next week, and I'll have them and see you uh, uh, July fourth. It shows up the first week of January. The reason I ask that, it's not a provision like it's got to be 24 hours in advance, so that we can expect that 24 hours before July third, we're going to. Have all, it could be trickling mm -hmm. in any time, right? And it will. I think that more than likely, most people will come directly from the retailer and stop and get their permit. I suspect. Right. They'll be unsuspecting they even needed a permit until they went and bought the fireworks. I would. I would say we we have it that we have all the fire stations have the ability to do it. Regular hours, no special staffing. Police departments open 24/7. So they could do either. If they were in their neighborhood and they wanted to stop by the local fire station, they could. If they were right. coming back from... Because <coughs> it station. takes no special scrutiny or knowledge on the part of the staff person. All they really need to do is say, here it is. You need to read it, fill it out properly, and sign it. Could, could I ask you a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I was, I was going to just ask, if, do, do we need there to be a staff interaction? I mean, could it just be a pile of forms in the lobby of the public safety building? and somebody fills it in and drops it in the box. Well, and I think probably we need to have some certification that the, the, the application has been received. You know, it would be like a stamp or that, that would acknowledge. And so, you know, it, it, it and probably photocopied so it would be on file. Are there any circumstances under which we would not issue a permit? I mean, I think of the burn permit, it's, of course, promulgated through the state and uh, the, the Forest Service, wind and weather conditions dictate whether permits issued or not. Arguably, those same concerns apply in this case. We're talking about mm -hmm. flammable items and... Um, I, I, I was going to... That's a good question. Whether we should make it explicit in, in the uh, ordinance that um, the fire department may issue a notification the simplest thing to do is to tie it to that same system that exists uh, administered th through the main forest service. Right. They already determined for other for the same reasons that it's not acceptable to have outdoor burning. That was another question that I had on my list that I was going to get to eventually. It could, because it came up in discussion before, I think you could make an argument on both sides of this um, that it isn't... Uh, the class day determinations are made for open burning. I mean, it's a an open, unprotected fire built on the ground. Um, you could make the case that consumer fireworks is not as dangerous as that and whether or not that standard is applicable or not. But further, in terms of this whole permitting process, I think that would layer, that would add a layer of complexity that would be difficult for what you just envisioned, Bill, in terms of yes, it would. doing it on the first, yeah, because could, those yeah. are set daily. Mm. And you would not be able to get a permit, as you can't get a burning permit now, except after they have made that determination in the morning of the day you want to burn. Burn permits are issued day of? Day of only. Now, I say only. There is a, there's a flaw in the system in that the state, to raise revenue, came up with this online burning permit process where you can pay 
a fee to get a permit, and that permit's good for three days. <laughs> yeah, if your brother knows somebody. Yeah. <laughs> but theoretically, if the if it changes to a class three on those other two days, you're technically not supposed yeah, to burn. I was just and thinking to, to the chief's earlier comment about our, is there some unintended or unintentional liability that we're assuming by issuing a permit? And just imagine us issuing a permit on a day and a you know, very dry day in the middle of the summer, around July, um, that open burning is not allowed and, God forbid, something happens. And, and that's why I'd rather not tie it to the... I think it would only be under unusual circumstances that you would judge conditions to not justify the use of fireworks. Uh, as opposed to the the state burn permit. Uh, yeah, I just am concerned about that kind of discretion that you suggest. I think we'd need to have some rationale for denial. Somebody has to sign the name to this, and that was my initial question. Yeah. Is there any liability by virtue of somebody, one of my employees, saying, yeah, yeah, it's okay for you to, burn, to shoot this off? Right, but yeah, could, could, this, could this be resolved by just by adding a uh, to the application that this is not a an assumption of you know your judgment. We're expecting you to use your judgment uh, to as to the the danger associated with starting a fire. We'll probably come up with talk to town attorney and come up with some language whether it would hold water. Ultimately, I mean, you can be sued at any time for anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> And, and, it, and it really is. I'm just going to invite Captain Butler up because he was studying the NFDA codes and stuff applicable to this. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I, I currently issue all the fireworks permits in town over to Beechwood Speedway um, and other um, venues that. Non consumer. Non consumer stuff. Sure, but also, also Beechwood is launching consumer cakes over there as well. So we've had to. Um, with that, they're not required to get a state permit anymore because the laws changed for consumer use. They don't need a state fire marshal fireworks permit for that anymore. So to make it so if Beechwood could still do that, we decided, okay, well, they've, they've got permits before from the state and we'll issue them a local permit for their display of their fireworks. So it's, it's something that we probably eventually should tweak in our ordinance to make it so they're 100% compliant, but they're pulling the permits um, and we're inspecting those. And also for like the community services events, we have Summerfest and Winterfest. We issue permits for those as well, and typically those are consumer cakes. And then they do have some aerial shells as well. Um, a, a piece of this, I'm not looking to throw a monkey wrench in anything, but my job is enforcement and issuing building permits and fire permits and whatnot. Um, some of the guidelines, I think it's a really good direction to go in, but um, an insurance carrier, um, you know, all, all the shows that we have in town, um, they're required to prove um, liability insurance, and it's a couple million dollars of insurance. I don't think any homeowner is going to have the type of insurance that you're describing of what they're supposed to have um, in this. That might be an issue to include. Um, it, it, it sounds great on paper to say, yeah, you need to have property insurance and whatnot, but probably if you read your documents of your homeowner's policy, it's going to say don't use fireworks in your property. We're not covering you if anybody's injured. Um, and the, the permitting piece, another comment I have is it's great to issue a permit. It's more of a notification that, hey, these people are launching so the police department and dispatch knows. But from my piece, um, with a permit should come an inspection to look at it because there is an NFPA standard on display of fireworks even for consumer. It's NFPA 1124. And typically, you know, to simplify it for you guys, it pretty much says you shouldn't use fireworks for display purposes within 75 feet of combustible structures or vegetation. So if we're issuing a permit as the town of Scarborough, Scarborough Fire Department, and we're saying, yes, you have our permission to do it, we don't inspect it, and somebody gets hurt, I think some attorney could probably come back and say, hey, Mr. Fireman or whoever you were that issued it, you probably should have known the NFBA code that's in effect, and you probably should have inspected it. There may be some liability out there would be one of my concerns. I can currently tell you we do inspect all of the shows that we have in town now via permit, so I think the inspection piece is a big piece of it. Um, I think, you know, Personally, I'm a fan of fireworks if they're used safely and appropriately. Um, and I, I don't want to deter the use of fireworks, but I think um, you have some wrenches here, some finer details to work out. And I think there may be some liability that the town has or the fire department has by issuing these permits without doing an inspection. See, I, th I think the liability, we don't require anything now. We just say, hey, go ahead, go for it. I mean, h here now we're making an effort to have the process be more responsible. So in terms of 
are you increasing or decreasing your risk of liability? Uh, I would think that arguably we are decreasing our risk of liability because we're tr making every effort at getting people to act responsibly. We've got an ordinance that says just go ahead and do it any way you want because we don't have any restrictions uh, of the type that we're intending to introduce here. So. Uh, and the way the way I see it, I don't mean to interrupt you, but we're taking a hands-off approach with our current ordinance, how it sits. As soon as you ha create a permit process within the ordinance, you're putting a signature, who's somebody's name, who's an employee of the town, and I think just my my personal view of it is you are, where we're taking a hands-off approach, and that's giving the people the freedom to use the property the way that they want to because they're the king of their castle, which is fine. But as soon as we start putting some layers on this. I think that by us signing something, some, some attorney someday when somebody you know, injures themselves is probably going to come knocking on our doors and say, hey, you issued this permit. But extension of that logic would mean that if we choose not to ban it, we have some liability. Mm -hmm. we're, we're tacitly approving it. Right. Uh, I, mean, I agree. So, uh, and this is, we'll probably never get a definitive answer for that, to that question. It is. Well, it, it, is it possible? Yeah, because we live in a democracy where uh, access to uh, the judicial process is relatively unlimited, and that's a good thing. Uh, it's why everybody gets insurance. Yeah, who's responsible? And that's why we have insurance, to cover against those one in a million t chances where something goes wrong. And just further that, that's one of the reasons there are tort limits for municipalities, because right. our exposure is extreme. Sure. It's one more thing to add to think about. Um, I did help write a uh, fireworks ordinance a few years ago for another community, and we actually banned them in certain parts of towns and districts uh, based upon um, people's size of their lots, and it wasn't feasible for them to launch any from their property because they were so condensed. So, for example, like Higgins mm -hmm. Beach, Pine Point, where you just don't have the space requirements to safely sure. launch them. So just something to think about that, you know, maybe um, adding, I don't want to try to complicate things for you, but in areas in town where they probably shouldn't be used, maybe a ban in other areas of town like North Scarborough where they have a lot of land and it's open and it's safe and, um, you know, might might be a good idea. So just okay. a suggestion. Did you, did you put a a limitation there about 75 feet from we did. structures. Yeah. yeah, we talked about structures, um, uh, vegetation, you know, like heavy vegetation and power lines. That, that whole approach was talked about at its inception, really using lot size as the definitive standard. Yeah, lot size uh, and as opposed to someone getting a tape measure out and measuring 75 feet, that's simply not going to happen. Mm -hmm. I, I think education and therefore enforcement is going to be the biggest challenge there. I would guess the easiest way is kind of north and south or east and west of the turnpike. You know, some broad delineation in town as opposed to lot by lot depending on its size. Could we use a, could we use a zone? And I and I do think that's the Our direction. Like land use zone, yeah. like zoning district. No, not in TBC or most people have no idea what the zone district they're in. But uh, you could, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Did you? But, but, no, I just had a question about the. The permit. Oh, I, I was hoping to, but go ahead. Yeah, I'm you sorry, what? you were t you were sneaking away. I was hoping you could stay up. For He's a <laughs> now, my only question about the uh, you know proof of insurance. W would would you see that as are we taking their word for it that they yes. have insurance, or would we? That's be the intent of the yeah. okay. that it's a representation. These are a series okay. of representations okay. they're making. There, no one's going to be required. Uh, and under the other uh, fireworks ordinance, you may actually require them to produce. A policy, so you can see it, uh, but we're not okay. we're not going there. I wonder is is there another document that we could that we could do rather than calling it a permit, which suggests that we're allowing them or, or per being permissible uh, or somehow agree being complicit in the in the setting off of these fireworks, but just to inform us of their intent to Not do it notification it would, uh, some kind of notification and set, and not call it a a permit per se mm -hmm. um, and still have the you know, still have the good neighbor guidelines. So why don't you call it a notification requirement? Because it's notifying the town that Top Fireworks is going to be launched in this location. It, it also requires notification of the butters. Yeah. And if with maybe a contact number so that if we had yeah, it, I wouldn't we had somebody we could get a hold of or something. It could have the same sort of information. Just all the same information, just not call it a permit at the top of that address. So your concerns there in terms of liability. I think so. I mean, a lot of 
other permits, some other towns, they've used the term with the chief said notification application. Ah. So it's notifying that the, the, the local authorities and the town, the city, that, that activity is taking place, so it might not be a bad idea. Um, but I think making the language clear on in the ordinance and in the application saying, you know, we're not saying that this is safe, you know, the liability is on you as a property owner and the person launching these fireworks, um, but we're acknowledging the receipt of your notification to us that you're going to be launching these tonight, and so in case we get any complaints, the police will be able to support you. Yeah, I kind of like that idea because I think the other thing you could do with that, if you're not having to sign a permit, that opens it up for online forms and convenience for the residents to comply with this notification process versus the issuance of a formal permit. That's a great point. That may yeah, be something worth considering. Mm -hmm. that yeah. <coughs> yeah, the, the, the form could be online uh, and you need to sign it, scan it, send it. It could be a direct email thing into dispatch and we log it into our, we've got a burn permit log that we use now as we yeah. issue them manually mm -hmm. so that if there is an issue, the dispatcher pulls up, you know, somebody smells smoke. They pull that up before they send the fire truck yeah. and say, well, yeah, guy around the corner is burning today and has a permit to do so. We could log those as they come in electronically and that might be a solution to consider. So we could... I'll say downgrade this rather than calling it a permit. We call it the Consumer Fireworks Notification Form. Yeah. Still require the uh, the vendors the, that are Chicago based anyway to make sure that the purchaser is aware that they must file this and have it on right. record at the. But it's a requirement. Therapy. And rather than official use and kind of permit issuance, it would be kind of a, an acknowledgement, uh, yeah. downplaying it just. And then we can look into putting an online electronic form. Yeah. We can add your your rules, your suggested right. things, all part of that. Sure. So before they have them check off that they, they have insurance and that they've read the rules. And yeah. yeah. Good. Uh, one, one more thing to consider I wanted to bring up um, as well, because we've had a lot of people coming and asking about fireworks requirements and whatnot, and they're not allowed or not. I've had probably five or six in the past couple of years come in, people come in that, um, religiously, I can't remember what beliefs they follow, but they set off fireworks. And they weren't able to set off fireworks. They're not in the dates range that you guys have listed here. So maybe if there was a provision in the ordinance, so if it's for religious, I mean, I don't want people to take it, you know, abuse that. But the, the people that came in and talked to me were pretty upset that we couldn't allow them to do it. it they were celebrating a, a religious holiday. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. I've seen that five or six times now. And I think they ended up launching some, and they got a visit from the police department. And, uh, you know, I think they were doing it in a safe manner. They were really small fireworks, but they were over the threshold of where they were consumer fireworks. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to give you a feeling for what I'm seeing on the ground up there, just for some su suggestions. Thank you. And if I could, yeah. Bill, I'd like to just go back to what Jim said earlier, just for clarification. He talked about how we have two fireworks ordinance. We have the display fireworks ordinance, which right. takes care of the large shows like Beechridge's big show at the 4th of July, and we've got this consumer one. We have a number of requests throughout the year for weddings, for the Beechridge smaller shows, proximate shows. We, we call them proximate shows, and they are done with the same Class C consumer type of fireworks. Because we've had the restriction in the consumer ordinance to those five days per year, when these events come, we have been permitting them under the display ordinance. That display ordinance currently requires a state fire marshal's permit because that was written under the guise before consumer fireworks were legal, and they were shows that were put on by technicians, and they were the larger type shows. Now that consumer fireworks are legal, we're getting a number of these requests for the smaller, what they call proximate shows in the codes. And we have administratively just been issuing those that way, but we've been requiring the um, technician to launch them off. So even these small shows have had to hire a technician to do it, to make sure that they were following all the other sure. aspects of the permit. The conflict is the state has stopped issuing that state permit for Class C explosives. So we probably should revisit that display ordinance 
and make that minor change at some point. Okay. I guess I just wanted to make sure from a policy standpoint that you folks were happy uh, with how we are doing that. There, there aren't a lot of them, but we're issuing probably a couple dozen a year for these smaller type events. Um, I wonder if, if we were to fix the, um, that display uh, perm permitting or ordinance, if, if it could address some of the, you know, the requests that you've seen, the five or six religious ordinances <coughs> you could issue outside of those dates. I mean, it's a financial burden as well. I mean, some of these are relatively small types of things. I mean, we would we would want to continue to permit them as we have for like the Beach Ridge shows when there's hundreds of people there in the audience. But at the same time, you know, a small wedding uh, in a, a place that's got plenty of room and, and clearly we could meet the the uh, distance requirements. So you're thinking that the uh ordinance that governs the Beach Ridge Road shows should be looked at so as to more clearly allow things like a wedding event or... I think we have had the authority, we, we've interpreted the ordinance that we've had the authority to do this, but only if we require a technician to be there. Right. And I think we need to take care of the change in state law where they will not issue a, a permit for a Class C show anymore. Um, that being said, I'm asking from a policy direction, do you have any appetite or should we explore loosening those regulations any to allow those without a technician? I guess that's the crux of my mm -hmm. question. What is the cost of, the, uh, of that permit? Is it differentiated at the small cost? I think it's $50. $50? $50? Yeah. Hmm. I thought you were going to ask the cost, cost of the for technician. technician. Yeah, no, oh. I'm not I, sure. It, Do you? Have I think it dry, I don't have the exact number, but I know it dries it up substantially because you're paying for their time and their expertise. Sure. So, you know, you could go and spend $300 on fireworks, but then if you have to get a licensed tech, you're probably going to spend three or four hundred dollars just on the licensed tech. So that three hundred dollar sure. shows turn into a four. And uh, what you know, worries me is uh, is uh, uh, whether by uh, authorizing it for any special yeah. event, then it would become so common. That's why I'm asking the question. I, I'm not proposing that we make any huge changes, but I wanted to bring it to your attention. You know that that there's there's some gray area in there, that, but that I'm not sure I'd be interested in. For the proximate shows, though, I mean, you're going out and you're doing an inspection of the site at that point and making sure that... Correct, and I think the difference is, is under the display ordinance, it's when it's for a large audience, which it's, again, a gray area, but we're, you know, for me, a, a large group is 50 or more. It's when you're in assembly classification, large crowd, higher probability of an accident happening. So, I mean, I think under that, if people need to follow what you guys are doing here for this ordinance, but if it's other... And for example, town and country has, has come to us before and they've had to hire a technician. They, they've done some shows out there, and, but it's for a crowd of you know, 75 to 100 people. We've slid them in under the um, display ordinance um, and got a permit, and yes, we do inspect those when it's a larger number of people. So, Keep, Keeping it uh, in that fashion, I think, is appropriate uh, because it is a large event. Uh, uh, reducing it to an amateur setting off the fireworks I don't think is a great idea uh, and it also it just opens up I think uh, a myriad of issues that we're I think we're trying to go, go in the opposite direction and I concur Bill I just wanted to have this discussion yeah. while we were talking about it just to make sure that we were on the same page. Can I ask one more question? When, you, when you're referring to the, the fact that the state won't issue the permit for a class C does the ordinance Specify that they need the state permit to set up. Yes, and I think what I will do is forward you a recommended yes. change to that, and that minor be, section that of that just to bring us into compliance. I t totally, I think Will and I totally agree with that. Sure. <coughs> okay. Yeah. So and then, I'm sorry. Go last ahead. question. Go ahead. In, in the display uh, ordinance, does it specify a, a, a crowd of a certain size, or is it just at your discretion? I I can't remember. I think it's at our discretion. It's not okay. specific to like you know 25 or more. So. So if we modify this uh, to be a notification requirement mm -hmm. and notification application, uh, I think administratively we can deal with uh, how it would be 
dealt with from uh, uh, the a the application actually being submitted. Yeah, we can we can talk about yeah, that. Yeah, we can person or online. Those are administrative deals, details we can sort mm -hmm. through. Okay. I might suggest a simple add, whether it's to the permit application or maybe on the guidelines, we actually add the allowable dates, the allowed dates as well. Uh, let's not assume that the right person's reading the ordinance. Uh, so okay. while we're having these, it's easy enough just to put those dates specifically on the forms. Yeah. One thing, are you looking to include the application within the ordinance? Because one thing I would, we, we change applications a lot just because of how we track things. And if we ever made an a ch uh, administrative change to this application, it would have to come back to the ordinary mm -hmm. review committee to be amended. So maybe it just says that you could make it more broad that an application is needed, and then we can produce you guys an application that's in line with the rest of our applications we issue for. Because we already have an application for fireworks, we can just tweak it in the same format for tracking purposes that ask the same exact stuff and can just reference your specific guidelines. My, hunt, my preference would be to have it added. I appreciate your point. Perhaps what we can do, since this committee has not passed it along yet, we can get your input and modify this form so it's at least to your liking at this point. And once again, it's not a permit, it's a notification, right. so I yeah. don't yeah. much care what it looks like as long as we're getting the information. And Boy, a, bounce, uh, a band sounds easier and easier, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the, only uh, thing that, the only thing I would want to make sure, is, and obviously this would certainly allow for it, but I just would want to make sure that um, you know we've got a good date time stamp such that we're not going to some place where they don't have haven't notified us and taking some enforcement action and then having them later claim that they uh, did because they've submitted something after. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You have to say you're wrong and rip the ticket up. And <laughs> 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 you don't do it often. Okay, so uh, <laughs> the only other uh, change possibly is that I, I think um, Chief Moult made the point that it does read uh, issued by the Scarborough Fire Department. I think we talked about doing both. Uh, the Scarborough yeah. Public Safety. Yeah, sure. Uh, issued by Scarborough Public Safety. Good. Uh, and uh, the uh, process for obtaining the application will get that one straight. So good. All right. So that uh, we'll have a notification uh, change. Uh, we'll have it be uh, issued by Scarborough Public Safety. We'll clarify how the town will issue the, per the notification itself uh, and the uh, retailer section uh, uh, will reference notification, not a permit. Okay. So just so that I clearly understand, are we intending for this all to be online or that just to be an option? Uh, what do you mean all? Well, I mean, could you still go to exclusively on the oh, and get a permit online. and get a uh, and serve them with your notification, or would it all be online, or how would we? I would think not, simply because not all people have access to uh, getting online, and so uh, I think once the, the the notification form is settled, we place them with uh, uh, you and all of your substations and. But it would be clear, I think, in the notification that it can be done online. Okay. And and is that something that you would want us to explore with IT or whoever? I would like you to explore that. Again. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of where I was going from. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can work together. I One eight hundred John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure, on speed dial. <laughs> I see that as just an extension of good customer service. If we can make it easier for folks to access it and submit it, we will. Thanks, for good idea. Well, one more comment. For the retailers, there's a requirement in your ordinance that talks about them providing um, 
the guidelines at their stores. Yep. So we, the fire department inspects them annually, so we'll have to add that to our inspection checklist. Um, within your ordinance, I think it says the police department is the authority having jurisdiction on the ordinance. I don't know if it, it's a minor detail. I'm just thinking an enforcement piece from the fire department, if I write them up for not having these guidelines, I have to technically have the police department enforce that. So I don't know if there's an opportunity in there to cluster public safety under the enforcement piece, but know that the police department would handle complaints and that the fire department's gonna be inspecting when needed on on mm -hmm. as needed basis for mm -hmm. the occupancy that are selling them. But just a thought. Sounds pretty reasonable. Yeah. Would it please the committee, um, dare I suggest you hold this over for one more meeting to see it all come back as a complete document and perhaps we can bring the companion piece of the uh, display ordinance and kind of deal with these all at one shot. You know, bring them both forward to the council. Yeah, okay. I think, yeah. I think the, uh, I think we'll make it by July if we were to wait one more meeting. Okay, that's good. Good, we can do that for your next meeting. Tracy, you get all those changes? <laughs> She's right on it. <laughs> Good. Uh, uh, motion to place this. Oh, uh, I second the motion to table. Was that your? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Excellent. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Mr. McQuinn is, I think he was here, or I just, I'm suggesting maybe you take that Light. item six out of order. Okay, well, yeah. uh, any objection to taking uh, item six out of order? Nope. Oh. Uh, next item, discussion on lighting and good neighbor ordinances, uh, public comment. Anyone wishing to address this matter can... Go to the podium. You going to start with public comments? Yes. Uh, or noise? Uh, the uh, only changes that are proposed are to the lighting ordinance. So, uh, but bo it, it's both. My name is Kevin McQuinn. I live at 17 Williamsburg Lane. And, uh, you know, I've just been following the, the notes that you put in the agenda before it goes out. I was able to get the changes and a uh, lot of clarity this time versus last. I, I, I am curious to know when, um, a, like, a final piece would be put together and when it might go to the, the council. Uh, uh, I expect that uh, by the end of today, you'll have the answer to that question. Okay. So, um, yeah, well, I thought that, uh, you know, basically I think it's, it's a good plan. Um, one of my thoughts or concerns is that, and in notes that I sent a couple of emails to you folks just saying that, you know, I think that the lighting ordinance itself um, probably could stand on his own. And I see the way that you put it in the ordinance that it, it kind of could. You could keep developing that if you wanted to aside from the other issues. So I think that's that's good. Um, I do think there's a lot of questions that need to be uh, asked and answered though. I don't mean a lot, but you know, a handful. I've been talking to a couple of the, the architects, engineers in town about lighting. Um, been a lot of changes with lighting in the last 10 years as, as we all know. And uh, I think for the most part, this protects a lot of, a lot of things. I, I noticed in the first paragraph where it says that it's to protect the residential neighborhoods. Um, I know all three of you guys were at the, um, the land trust uh, meeting last week. And I sent, uh, I sent her a nice email afterward. And I think that, uh, that these lighting issues should be, we need to think through that. And I think things like uh, parks, and preserves and beaches need to be considered. Somebody who has a big mansion on the beach and shines a spotlight out in front of their house um, to, to keep uh, 
riffraff away or what have you, that just ruins the walk for anybody on the beach. And I just think there's a couple little things that could be thought about that. I went snowshoeing last Friday night. I came back to my house and there's, you know, I'm basically heading toward a, uh, a lighthouse that's my, uh, the light on my neighbor's uh, home. I didn't need a lighthouse, you know, that's not why I went out there. I wasn't lost, I knew where I was going. It's open space, it's nice. I just think that um, in addition to the residential neighborhoods, we should think about the other special places in town because we have a lot of them. Um, the, uh, I saw that we had put in there that, um, that you, were, you wanted to limit the spillover at, at 0.1 foot candles. And I just want to show you something that could. Um, <coughs> I, I may have told you guys last time. I, um, uh, I measured the light at that property line. This is 1.3 foot candles uh, on my house. That's what 1.3 looks like. And I had said, I think, That's I think you need to see what 1.3 looks like in real life mm -hmm. before you limit it to one. No. There's a lot of... I think it's one-tenth of one. Yeah. It's one-tenth of one, but that's... It's point one, but... Not, it's not one. Point oh five is where I'd like to see you go. And uh, just with that... Well, that's 1.3. This is... This is one point, uh, no, this is point one three, point one three. So I think you need to see what point one three is like before you, you go to one, because even if, if you take 40% away from that picture, it's still way too much light. Is that at the property line, sir, or is that? That's at the property line of the uh, 0.13. The next point was uh, you did say in there that uh, that lighting is serves to um, to help with security, mm -hmm. and the state has a great um, the state has a great lighting guidelines, and. Uh, Um, it basically is a manual for uh, quality lighting in communities, and it says that it's it's a um, it's not correct that that more lighting makes something more safe um, because what happens, and this is again my house, because um, it creates dark, dark, dark shadows, and if somebody was really wanted to create a problem, mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot easier to hide in that shadow than it is in a, in no shadow. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to add that to your sure. uh, little bit of information. I don't have tons of stuff here, but the other thing that I was trying to get a better understanding of from some engineers of this whole thing of uh, the amount of, the amount of light uh, in a, in a bulb, you know, there, we have, We've seen lights change from what used to be yellow light, yellow light that was, um, it, it wasn't really that intense, it, it kind of, it, uh, it glowed out, whereas LED lights, they, they, they stare right at you. They don't, there's nothing fuzzy about them, they just, um, they bore into you. And I do like, I think a lot of the boxing will be a, a big help to certain things. Those lights that you see are, those are three floodlights shining on my house with no protection at all. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming that those types of things will just go away. But um, I am concerned still about um, some of these incredibly bright LED lights. For instance, uh, if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, there are flood, floodlight looking bulbs that uh, throw off three, up to 3,000 lumens, right? That's how they measure light right at the bulb. And a typical floodlight that 
you know, regular old floodlight 100 watts that you'd have um, on your garage to play basketball, um, that would be somewhere around 250, 300 lumens. So it's, there, it's a tremendous difference. Um, I like the idea of lights all needing to be shaded, uh, you know, covered that from one property you can't see the actual light, the bulb. Um, no, like architects, you look at this, uh, no architect would design a house with a garish light that wasn't bouncing off something as opposed to directly, mm -hmm. you know, shooting at you. And to the extent that um, we could think through that a little bit and make sure that lights are, um, are shielded. There is, a, there is a light in our neighborhood where somebody has a post out in front of their house. And the light bulb in it, I can't really find one. It's, it's, it's a tube, and it's an LED, and it is bright. I mean, it is incredibly bright. And I think that's fine, but that's a good example of that should be shielded. It should be shining down or up, whatever, <laughs> just down, in my opinion. Um, and you shouldn't have to look at that bright, 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 intense light. And only the last thing I would say um, would be about uplighting and lighting uh, properties. When people first started lighting houses and backyards and trees and so forth, it was all very subtle and it was really quite nice. And now, for whatever reason, people go out and they buy cheap floodlights and an extension cord and they beam, you know, again, four floodlights on their house. And granted, they're not pointed at somebody else, but the house next to me is bright yellow with bright white paint. And no matter how, again, I'm not a lighting expert. I, I know more than I knew a month ago. <laughs> but the light that reflects off that is unbelievable. So I don't know the answer to that type of situation. You know, if it was a brown house with you know, gray trim, it wouldn't be the same thing, but it is something that we need to think about. Um, it, whether there was a time limit, you know, whether people can light their house till 10 p.m., um, I'm not like green, 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 but I'm kind of green, and, you know, we waste a lot of energy with light that we don't need. Um, and, you know, Scarborough's a, I think, a model town for a lot of reasons, and uh, I don't think it would hurt us to take a little bit of a stand and use that as a, um, you know, for some of our reasoning that, you know, part of this is not just to shield lighting and to avoid nuisance, but some of it is to do our part that we can to, you know, conserve energy. Um, I don't think that has to be the biggest thing, but um, I don't want to. I don't want to miss that opportunity either. So those are my comments. Um, you know, I, I do think it seems to be shaping up well. I want you to, I would like you to consider the, the, the points I made. I do think that having a, a lighting guy, um, I talked to somebody, one of the calls I got during that first part of the meeting was <coughs> someone at uh, Goral Palmer where Dan's going to work, and he's a lighting guy, and he answered a bunch of questions for me. But he also made it clear that there are people that are just lighting people that could clarify a few things and come up with some very little amounts. <laughs> I don't think we need a lot, but I think some of it needs to be specific, and I think some of it needs to just be thought through. Um, the good news is you can always come back and take another bite at the apple, but um, I, I'm grateful that you guys are doing this now. and. Uh, Yeah, I, I'm, thank you. I'm excited about Thanks it. Thanks for your anyway. comments. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Uh, Larissa Crockett's worked on this extensively. Uh, do you want to kind of uh, take a shot at com coming up to the table? And, sure. Uh, Thanks, guys. You're See you. And uh, let's see if we can walk ourselves through. We have not previously done the new draft that was provided at your place. Yeah. Okay. okay. And so the new draft should have the number 611 at the top. And when you look at the back page, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, 
um, you should see number six, effective date of repeal and replace. Okay, and this draft, uh, uh, why don't we start by explaining the differences between <coughs> this draft and the draft that was posted online uh, with the agenda last Monday. Certainly. Thank you. So first difference is, is going to just, starting at the very beginning, your table of contents is updated to actually reflect what's in the, in the draft, okay? Um, we also have at the top of the ordinance now a purpose that applies to the entire ordinance. Um, so that language now reads, the Scarborough Town Council recognizes certain basic standards that allow residents to enjoy their homes and property, preserve peace and quiet in our neighborhoods, help maintain property values, and prevent disputes among neighbors. The purpose of this ordinance is to promote these standards and allow for enforcement of violations. Okay. The general um, purpose. Then the second, the first section, creation of nu noise nuisances, um, has been broken into two parts, being noise upon a public right of way, and noise abatement, so language has not changed. It's simply a formatting change. Good. So you just picked up what was on the books already? Yes, those are exactly the same. No Good. language in that has been changed, but they have been rearranged. Okay. Um, Tom made an excellent suggestion that we could strike the enforcement section under um, noise upon a public right of way and have one enforcement section, um, so you'll see that as part five, okay? so in the now newly titled Creation of Noise Nuisances, which is housing all of the language from the noise ordinance and the noise abatement ordinance, there's now mm -hmm. simply one enforcement section, section five in that piece. It's on page four. Uh, paragraph number five? Yep. And that applies to? Both the sections, noise abatement and noise ordinance. So the um, noise upon a public right of way as well as noise abatement. It probably yeah, it reformatted not as five as something else. Uh, like C or three, I would think. Looks like it only applies that to abatement. My oversight oh. abatement. No. Yep. No. Gotcha. So that's just a scrivener's thing we yeah, yeah, yeah. take care of. Great. So uh, just to just to make sure that it, it's clear that that enforcement provision <coughs> applies to equally to A and B. Mm -hmm. Right okay. And abatement. So and that and you're referring to uh, E enforcement on page five? Um, no, actually on page four. It's currently numbered number five. Yep. It and really probably shouldn't be because that flows under the abatement. Right. It see, that be flows, C. see, that's that's under the abatement. So it'll be actually C. So it will cover both A and B. I apologize. Yeah, let me just. So A is noise in the right of way. If you flip the page, B is yeah. the abatement. Yep. And then C would be the enforcement that would carry, cover both those. Okay. Good, good. Yeah, that makes sense. B. They're on page four, Bill, what you've just turned. Nope, it should be back one more. It should be page. Oh, no, you're right. I'm sorry. Page no. Four. Yeah. So this would become C. Okay. And But there's no language change there, simply a move of the enforcement section to okay. cover both. All right. So no renumbering needed for the uh, paragraph three creation of lighting nuisances. Right. I don't believe so. Okay. So, all right. So we get to the new. Right. Court. So the changes that are taking since since the Monday posting. Uh, one, let's stop for a second. Uh, the new C <laughs> covers both noise and lighting? No. Just lighting. Oh, I'm sorry, new C? Just noise. Joyce no, noise. Just, just, just noise. noise. Okay. Because there's a separate enforcement provision for lighting. For lighting, good. And differences. Good. All right, I'm with you. Okay. So then, um, since the Monday posting, the ch so other than numbering and lettering changes in format, um, we have in, in Section 3, Part D, Outdoor Light Prohibitions. Yep. Number one is now to read any unhoused light source. Okay. 
And that previously had been... It had more language regarding um, unshielded lights in a luminaire. Um, and the reason for that change is? Uh, planning was concerned that the language that was there previously would prohibit a homeowner from having a lantern-style light fixture at their home. That a lantern-style light fixture um, would not be... The, 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 so the whole language was a unshielded luminaire, an uh, unshielded light in a luminaire, um, and it went on to talk about that was visible from an, a neighboring property within a, reason, like right. a, anyway, a, a normal sight range from a neighbor. Of a any un, uh, unshielded light fixture, essentially, is what it But it was. had language about visibility from within normal range of right. a residential property, and planning said, that's, I can see a light. <laughs> like we can't make it so you can't see anybody's light, that that just doesn't work. And he was also concerned that it was too restrictive as to the type of light fixture that people could have. Mm. Do, do we think that, because you see the lantern style lights all the time, it's a very colonial style light for, uh, for houses. So uh, do we see any risk of... of uh, in trying to provide for that, that we've lost or... Remember the restriction just above, the light spillover still pertains. So regardless, uh, and that's a prohibition section, but the, that light restriction at the, as measured at the property line is really the thing that most so, important piece so that governs the, uh, you, you ha What it essentially says is by prohibiting any unhoused light fixture, it means you have to have a housing. You uh, may not simply have a bare bulb on the outside of your property. If you wish to bare bulb it inside, that's not our business. But we felt that also by insisting that there be housing of some form, not only is most housing going to provide, in, in theory, some shielding of some form, but it also, um, as lights have more and more things like mercury and so forth inside them, wouldn't it be nice to have a little bit of an extra shield around that if we have exterior light fixtures, that we don't want um, there to be that. It, that's not a major point, but it was another additional feature of wanting to make sure that housing was included in lights. So, so what this means is that it, there just needs to be a fixture, that it just can't be a bulb with no, but it, it doesn't say anything about the shielding itself, it's it just the housing, so, housing being. Right. Okay. Because, what, so one of the other, um, one of the things that also was pointed out from one of our planning people was that, you know, you may have a light fixture that has kind of an antique sort of look that has a glass ball, a mm -hmm. glass bowl around that light fixture and that that is a style choice and that to prohibit that is going perhaps too far. That, you know, it's, we have already put, um, that we are trying to avoid urban sky glow. We've, it, it, the intent is that we don't have spotlights heading up into the sky, mm -hmm. but that if somebody wishes to have a light that does not spill over onto the neighbor's property, but has an aesthetic, the, they prefer the aesthetic of a, of a glass ball, then they should have the authority to do that on their property, providing they're not spilling light into their neighbor's property line above and beyond what we've listed as acceptable. Gotcha. And would this restrict a, um, a floodlight, for instance, because that's typically just a bulb? So I think that a floodlight actually is not restricted here because I think a floodlight does have a housing. It, it, okay. You know, it's, it has, it's not just screwed in, it's not a bulb usually, just screwed into a socket. It's a MARF. So, so it would prohibit those. So if it was simply a bulb screwed into a, a, a socket, then that is now prohibited by this. But if it did have, you know, flange across the back or some form of housing, it would not be prohibited. Or if it had a glass front to it. But it would be prohibited from the spillover and from the light confinement mm -hmm. above. Mm -hmm. This is, of course, the concern of unintended consequence, that we're trying to address a concern that's been brought forward, and in doing so, the danger is that we create a, a set of requirements that infringe on all sorts of other... Legitimate that lighting seem perfectly schemes. acceptable. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. This is this is one where I would strongly recommend that let's not let the perfect get in the way of good. And mm -hmm. I think we need to start somewhere and have some experience before we we get too exacting about this. Mm -hmm. Larissa, uh, it, it says uh, uh, the light must uh, con uh, confine emitted light to the property on which the light 
is located, uh, which is a pretty absolute statement. I mean, that's you cannot have, but then it goes on to say that spillover light, which is emitted light, uh, and can only be one tenth of one foot candle at the residential property line. Uh, so yeah, I think that um, I think that confining. I mean, we can confine things. I think that the purpose of the following section, the spillover light, is recognizing that as soon as you put any form of light into a dark space, you're going to be able to see that light for far. I mean, we right, can be right. approaching Boston from right. Western Mass and we can see light. Mm, that right? is the problem. So there is no possibility of truly confining light simply to a property line. And especially in more densely populated residential areas, that is an unreasonable standard. So we're saying, look, you're confining your light and that your light is there to serve that property. And here's how we're defining that confinement for you. You know, we recognize that light is going to, by just its very nature, is going to spread beyond a property line because it can't be helped. But you may not allow it to spread more than one tenth of one foot candle over a property line. And the essence of this approach is to address the nuisance aspect of this. It's not to stop it at the property line. This is <laughs> where possible, but it's to allow the enjoyment of the neighbor. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Can I actually add a couple things here? We're we're kind of finished public. All right. Yeah. Uh, Can I ask a question? Where the that one tenth of one foot candle? Um, is that an industry standard or where did that stand? That is actually from? our commercial standard. So if you are a Walmart or some other large commercial property that we happen to let in next to a house, we require that any commercial property in our, in our site plan review, they are not allowed to have a lighting scheme that causes greater than one-tenth of one foot candle to spill onto a, a neighboring residential property. Residen yeah, residential. So, so it's a neighboring residential yes. property. So, so that's the standard. That that's the standard we've set for our site plan review standards for our commercial properties, and it seems that that was a good place to start with our, our requirements for residential properties onto other residential. And, and how do we measure that? So do we internally have the ability? We do not. Um, at, when we were discussing enforcement, um, the idea is that when there is an, a glaringly obvious problem, that that is enforceable simply by sight, and that it will be um, if if the neighbor who feels that they have too much light spilling onto their property calls and says, I think that this is a problem. The police or the code enforcement officer comes out. They see, they're like, I don't think that so that's it's a close too, call. That's right. Yeah, they're like, I actually don't think that is a problem. I think that that's, right. that, then the idea from, from code enforcement and from the police department was that it is now the responsibility of the homeowner who feels that he or she is aggrieved to contract with somebody to prove that that the burden of proof is somehow going to be shifted is so it going to need it work to be the other way if if i'm the one if i'm if i'm the home that someone's complaining about and someone shows up and says you need to change that i'd say show me so i think that the idea is that if the pol if if the police or the code enforcement officer arrives and they say that is an issue that the offending neighbor if they wish to challenge and then they would need to provide the proof that they have not offended Right, so it's, if, there, if, if it's not obvious to the enforcement officer. So it gives the officer the discretion to make the call. Right. That's if, clearly a violation. I'm right. sorry. Right. And then the party uh, who challenges that is responsible for the. To demonstrate that no, it doesn't, it's not even one tenth of one foot candle. Right. So the, the concern I heard from Sergeant O'Malley was that training, um, he mentioned that there's. You know, you'd actually have to have somebody certified in in light measurement, and that they certainly they simply at the police station are not going to they just don't have the resources for that. They're keeping somebody on staff who's consistently right. certified. It, you have to maintain it. That was not an option. The only people who actually have the skills are lighting engineers who have light meters and who engage in light design, which <laughs> needs to be properly calibrated. There's all sorts of challenges right. associated with. Right. Yeah, so it should be there only if needed. Like the idea is that light is not supposed to be spilling over if it's clear that the that there's a property that is offending the intent of the ordinance. So that yeah, that's the the the, the basic standard is 
It's not supposed to happen. Right. And then if and, and if it's innocuous, the person who's enforcing it gets to make the call. It's either innocuous or it isn't. The party who's not satisfied with that decision has the right to be able right. to go ahead and prove that they've been wronged in the decision. Right. Do, but you, do you go so far as to acknowledge that kind of discretion? This creates a very clear standard. Um, it doesn't speak to that discretion that we, we expect will be used, at least in the first instance. <laughs> well, I think that you mean explain that the person who comes out has the discretion in the first instance to make the judgment whether there's uh, a material amount of light being emitted I, I across. Suppose, I suppose that discretion is implicit and that they could write a violation and then the offending party would challenge it. Uh, I think it is. I'd like to think that people, these sorts of things could get resolved quickly and but that's not always the case. Okay. Good. Uh, so then the only other, ch you were going through the go changes ahead. from yes. that first um, Thank you. draft. The, so if we go to the back, the last page, page six, um, we have a, I've broken apart the penalty section to make it clear that these are the penalties for noise violations versus lighting violations. And just as a formatting note, good, good. the next change will be those shouldn't be capped. That was, again, sorry, my error. Um, and then the final change is at the very bottom, six there, effective date and repeal of prior ordinance. And so that, because currently our noise ordinance is Chapter 611, mm -hmm. and our current noise abatement ordinance is Chapter 614, that language is meant to repeal fully Chapter 614 and repeal the current 611 and replace it with this in the place of 611. So, yeah. And I didn't know how you were going to want to proceed, so I've simply put in a placeholder. This ordinance shall take effect 30 days after its adoption by the Scarborough Town Council. Um, of course, if you wish it to be immediately upon adoption, that's a, another option. Yeah, I think uh, council rules of the charter uh, dictates effectiveness now that I think of it. I'm not sure if you even need it. You would do this only in the event that you want it to be effective at a later date? At a special mm -hmm. time. I don't think you need to state it. Your charter <laughs> says when ordinances are effective, okay. and I think gotcha. they're midnight. We uh, Lewis, so why don't we strike that? Sure. 12 a.m. the following day, I think, is what it says in the charter. Okay. So I think this is only in the event that you want it to be something other. So um, I guess Will and I don't know what one tenth of one candle. So I, I don't know if you noticed, but I was multitasking, uh, and uh, I, I pulled up a, <coughs> uh, a, a web page uh, from. NOAA, um, and it says that uh, twilight is uh, one foot candle, and a deep twilight is 0.1 foot candle, and full moon is 0 0.01 foot candles. So if that gives any perspective, it would be 10 full moons. I don't know the difference between twilight and deep twilight, personally. Um, that does make it seem, uh, to be fair, I would not appreciate having 10 full moons of light at my property line. I sure. do love a natural full moon at my property line. Yeah. So it may be that we want to consider um, changing that. The only thing that I would at all, and this is going to kind of lead into our next discussion or it references, when we're getting ready to discuss signs, there is language that prohibits ordinances sign ordinances from being more restrictive for non-commercial than it does commercial. Mm -hmm. And that did kind of flag, like if we're saying that commercial properties may have up to one-tenth of one foot candle, and then we say but resi resi up against a residential property. But then we say but a residential property is at a stricter standard. I wonder if that's actually defensible. Like if, if we're going to go in that direction, that it just, it's maybe something to look into to see if, if it's not allowable in the sign world, is it also therefore not allowable in light? Seems reasonable. Uh, let's see. So, um, one tenth is deep twilight. Deep twilight. I, I'm not sure what that means. 
But I think the, the what I do know is that a full moon, I mean, it casts a shadow when you're out in a full moon. But the full moon's 0 0.01. 0 0.01, exactly. So, so one-tenth of deep twilight? That doesn't make sense. The full moon casts more light than does yeah, I know. twilight, much less ten of them. Right. Strange to me. Yeah. Can we find another source? I'll look for another source. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> Maybe something that had, like, pictures. Uh, oh, yeah, because deep twilight is is assuming there's no moon out. I'm thinking like Ramadan standards, like how many foot candles can you distinguish a dark thread from a white thread? Right, like... A dark what? A dark thread from a white oh. uh, r white thread. Mm, okay. I'm not sure Google's going to give me that back. Uh, X foot candles. Hmm. We may be able to come up with a demonstration yeah. for you. You think so? That would be so much fun. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's, we can certainly research it rather than yeah, I think, I think speculating I what, or trying to find it right now. Yeah. But I, I would be concerned if that's accurate to, to think that. I, I think there is, there should be some level of comfort, perhaps not to Mr. Quinn, but that that standard, right or wrong, is rooted already in ordinance, and it's defensible for that reason, and I'm not aware that it's been a problem, frankly. Uh, Good. I think no one's come forward and said your standard is not strict enough. I guess I, what I'd be inclined to do is to um, see if we could set up a demonstration. This matter has to go f before the town council for a first reading, a public hearing, and mm -hmm. a second reading, so it's a long way from done. Mm. Uh, I would just as soon have it. Uh, Can I just observe one thing? I mean, it strikes me that in in some measure, if not large part, uh, we're doing this to satisfy some current issues. Right. The longer delays we have, allow those current conditions to exist. This standard, even if it's not as strict as it could be or should be, has to be a lot better than the current situation. <laughs> so I, I just observe that right. for you. Uh, we do expect to come back to you with adding maybe a third component of this right. regarding property maintenance <coughs> and such, you know, under the heading of good neighbors. So I suspect sooner than later, maybe under the watch of this committee, you may you turn or maybe <coughs> we'll be right. seeing this because ordinance uh, before you again. Okay. I just put that out. I, I, and we'll I, do what you like. Because yeah. I, I do think Larissa's point's well taken, that we ought to uh, have some consistency between uh, a commercial influencing a, uh, a residential and a residential influencing a residential. I mean, it only makes sense that you'd try not to uh, disfavor uh, a, a homeowner who happens to live next to a commercial. In either way, you're worried about a residential experience. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Regardless of who's emitting the light, that's right. in so the material. It's, it's the it's apples to apples. Is it's the residential uh, entity that's being impacted in both right. cases. So you'd like to protect them both to the same level of. So uh, there's value in consistency. Um, yeah. Uh, so why don't we see if we can, at some point, uh, do a demonstration? But in the meantime, I think we know that we're satisfied with the minor changes to uh, move it to move it forward mm -hmm. and if if we can get a demonstration uh, we can always amend it at uh, first reading first reading or or later we, it, or sounds like, it sounds yeah. like there could be or another second reading, uh, we're still talking uh, or maybe simply months. adopt this so you have at least a standard in place so while months. we work we're two on well, while while we work on a, while we work on an updated version that might include property maintenance, we got an email today about odors <coughs> that could also be explored. Hmm, uh, I didn't see that. I'd like Did to we? See it, it, please. Yeah, certainly. Um, and um, at the risk of uh, flying the ointment, can I? It just occurred to me. How about holiday lights? As Mr. Quinn was speaking. Um, very often folks will illuminate the front of their homes or their door or, uh, or what have you around, particularly around the holiday season, it seems. Mm -hmm. 
that may present a problem with one or more of these standards, and I don't know if that's a problem or not. Well, I, I think we tried I, to address that in section C1. So it says all outdoor light shall to the greatest extent possible be allowable for safety, security, operational needs, and decorative purposes. So the idea is that the intention there is to allow them. Now I agree that there may be some con there may be some challenge with then it follows, but must confine emitted light to the property in which the light is located, and the challenge is by means of shielded or hooded lighting elements. Yeah, and we certainly I don't shield or hood Christmas lights. Hmm. Well, I'm not thinking just the the, the, the smaller Christmas lights themselves. I, I'm thinking floodlights. Uh, it seems like there's at least one home in every neighborhood that has one pointed at their door, or mm -hmm. and some, sometimes they illuminate exactly. the whole front of their house, but and they're typically unshielded, ground-mounted floodlights. Right, pointed toward the house. Mm -hmm. Pointed to their own house. To their own, their own, house. Their own yeah. house. But there's, it reflects back, I suspect it's quite but that's, with that's white it. snow on the ground, it can, can light up. Ten days in December, maybe, but... Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm not looking to make a mountain of a molehill and, and it strikes Because that everybody who's ever passed one of these has had to answer that very question. What about Christmas lighting? Because uh, some houses are extensively lit and, mm -hmm. and would throw off tremendous amounts onto, and, and, and for those, I think you better be asking your neighbor if he's gonna be okay with that. Or Mr. McQuinn might say, um, you could do a holiday, holiday lighting with set to music and <laughs> cars could come by and <laughs> take advantage of it. Yeah. They yeah. put them up before Thanksgiving and they don't come down until yeah. Martin Luther King's birthday. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, and I, I'm sure that every town has said, we'll deal with it. Well, I, I think we might be covered by the spillover as, as with an appropriate right. set. Right. So, I mean, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I guess we'll see the we'll see the demonstration of what a spillover is and then otherwise, no, no reason to change it now not knowing Would you like to advance be consistent. to council mm -hmm. in the meantime? Yeah. To initiate the yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think it's well thought out, ready to go. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Good. So I move we to second. Further discussion. <coughs> All set. Favor. Yeah, Thanks for coming in. Yeah. The uh, the uh, uh, light candle is a good discussion. Uh, the public. We've got to clean it up. Uh, parks and beaches. Probably we would like to get through this now, but I think that's it's worthy of lighting sort of coming to all of our attention now and we're kind of being more careful to... Good. Thanks. Uh, uh, why don't you give us a, an updated report on signs. Okay. We're obviously past the appointed hour. I would go longer if we really were going to make a big deal out of where we are with signs, but I think you providing an update on the efforts that you've made and that you and I together have made will uh, be a good place to wrap it up because we've still got lots of work to do. Sure. So um, you may recall we were talking about temporary signs and there's the court case Reed versus Gilbert, Arizona. So when we opened up the, so we have a temporary sign ordinance but then we also have a very large section, 24 pages, of performance standards concerning signs in our, in our performance standards for our code enforcement office. And that be start, started to feel, including um, a couple of pages that deal specifically with temporary signs, none of which is content neutral, and so all of which needs to be dealt with. So it became a much larger project than, than simply um, repealing our current temporary sign ordinance and replacing it with a new one. Uh, so we uh, worked with Dan Bacon and Jay Chase, our senior planner, and um, Brian Longstaff, our code enforcement officer. Or is that his title? Zoning administrator. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and w kind of said, okay, guys, what do we want to do with this? We would have to deal with it. And so what is it going to look like? Um, so I sent everybody in that kind of group, including... Um, Councillor Donovan, a first crack of just kind of going through and highlighting everything that seemed to be content-based because the, the kind of the way to look at this is if you have to read the sign to know if it's allowed, your ordinance is wrong, mm. okay? So that's the basic minimum. Okay. Anything that requires you to read a sign to decide how big it can be, where it can be, how long it can be is no longer allowable, okay? So um, went through and highlighted all of the sections that I felt 
could possibly violate that standard and did strike throughs of everything I knew violated that standard. Mm -hmm. So we had sections about temporary signs for real estate, temporary signs for farms, temporary signs. Those were obvious violations. And um, then Jay Chase went through and, and highlighted a couple more areas that he was kind of questioning, met with Bill, talked about those issues, and came up with um, a set of four questions for our town attorney, Phil Saucier, and I spoke with him this afternoon. So question one was, is the ruling of in Reed, Reed Gilbert specific to temporary signs or does it apply to all signs? He said all signs, which we kind of expected, but we were hoping maybe not. So the second question was, all right, well, if it applies to both, you know, if the town is willing to accept some risk, can, you know, is there value in just dealing with the temporary sign sections because the commercial sign sections feel overwhelming and we just kind of want to deal with it bite by bite? And he said, sure, it's a quote from him, better to do something rather than nothing, but if we're going to take that approach, he recommended that we clearly lay out the process by which we will eventually deal with the commercial. So that we have, you know, we're dealing with temporary now, we're going to take care of that, and here's our plan of attack for dealing with the commercial and our timeline that we expect to be complete with that. Um, and he also suggested that if, if we do take that approach, uh, just make sure that we are not trying to enforce any content-specific um, decisions with our commercial properties that you know, we can still con continue to enforce you're in this zone, you can only have this much square footage of signage, but if we for some reason decided we wanted to enforce something regarding content and we haven't yet dealt with our ordinance, we really just shouldn't. And I, and I think the reason Larissa and I wanted to ask the question was because it <coughs> appears that the problem of getting through and having an ordinance fixed is materially more difficult when you take into account all commercial signs mm -hmm. that have been issued uh, for decades and decades uh, out there, as opposed to temporary signs, which by their nature are portable and temporary and come and go and, and generally have a, a, a date limitation on them. So uh, we, we thought we'd be really raising a problem for the planning department well beyond our expertise, mm -hmm. uh, and that we'd be opening up a hornet's nest with uh, a lot of commercial operations in our town who in good faith have gone forward and followed these rules. So that was why we asked that second question. Yep, and it, it, so I followed it up with not an approved question, I hope you don't mind, but when I was speaking with Phil, um, so, Part of what makes it so... Um, Remember, he bills hourly. I know. I was speaking, it was like a 20-minute conversation total. I was so fast. Um, but so one of the challenges with the commercial ordinance is the campus directory signage and all of the levels that we have for those campus directory signs. Like main medical right. partners campus. So I asked Phil, I said, you know, those are clearly, like you have to read the sign to know what size, but we don't care who you are as a campus. We just want to know, are you trying to target pedestrians with this sign? Are you trying to target an area of the campus with this sign? But it still needs to be read. And he said, he thinks all of that language can stand. That, um, that first off, commercial sign requirements can be more restrictive, that they don't have the same level of protection of free speech. And that because campus is a general term, we're not saying that if you're a church campus or a hospital campus or a school campus, you have different requirements. We're just saying if you are a yes. campus of some form, these things apply to you. So he thinks that those stand, which means that if we do decide to do them um, concurrently or if we decide to do them separately but we're developing a timetable, that commercial piece is now far less onerous. Okay. Okay. So that was a that was I think a good use of the good. minute and a half it took to ask him that question. Um, third question that I asked was regarding we had talked about um, distance between signs. So a reminder that current state statute requires that signs of a same or similar meaning cannot be closer than 30 feet apart. So when I broached that with Phil, he said I really feel uncomfortable with that that language of same or similar content because you'd have to read the sign. And I said, well, the state language has it. He's like, so we pulled up the state statute. He's like, you're right. <laughs> so he's like, he feels that we can certainly use that language because the state has used that language. Somebody decided it was defensible, but he was going to connect with um, 
his working group at MMA, he was on the working group that dealt with the MMA kind of guidelines um, to find out why the state felt that that was okay. It, he feels a little bit uncomfortable with that. And I agree with him. You would have to read the sign. It's in distinct violation of the basic tenet well, the here. the 30 foot is only for political signs, right? Not any longer because it's for now all temporary signs. All temporary signs. Right. There are also three bills in front of the legislature right now, um, LD-119, LD-209, and LD-1169. They all deal with temporary signs. Um, so it will be interesting to see how those come out. I'll track those over the next month and be able to report back to you the next time that we meet. So why, if, it, if the 30-foot separation uh, deals with any temporary sign, it's not, it is content neutral. It is not, actually. The 30-foot separation says temporary signs of the same or similar content may not be closer than 30 oh, okay. feet. Yeah. To solve that problem so, that we had discussed about, you know, you don't want to incentivize the first candidate who gets out the door gets to put out the signs. It, right? isn't, it isn't that it's uh, 30 feet separation for all no. signs. No, temporary because that signs. would be prohibitive of mm -hmm. any other candidate who didn't get right. there in time. Right. It's 30 feet for your sign. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, could we say from the, from the same owner rather than the content in that case? And then it would be, I guess, actually, you resolved it anyway. The state if the state okay. okay. So for right now, it's providing that nothing changes in the state statute, that should be fine. And he said that however we want to designate that. So Bill and I had discussed maybe putting out there the idea of um, we received a letter from a resident that apparently has been watching this conversation. And he suggested that, um, in, that it's easier to know the spacing and to enforce if you use like a, a clear mileage denomination because then people can use like you could use your odometer right on your car so um bill and i today tossed out you know maybe it's worth saying every two tenths of a mile or something along those lines like that you cannot have a, a sign of the same content or similar or same every x number of tenths of a mile that would be one way to think of that because you're talking that's a lot further than 30 feet, feet. yeah a tenth of a mile. And that, if that's the 500 feet. calibration you want to use. Yeah. So that was yeah, and one and idea. Well, because yeah. we started out the discussion previously saying, well, maybe one per lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but we kind of gravitated towards uh, tenths of a mile since uh, it's measurable on an odometer. Uh, What's the tenth of a mile? Well, 528 feet. feet. So. Uh, I didn't seem to me to be onerous. I mean, you, you'd still be able to litter your signs pretty much everywhere you want it. Uh, but it would be what, every 500 feet? If I'm not sure. Well, right, 528 feet. So, I mean, it's fair that it's the same for everybody. So, so that was one idea that we had. And, and Phil says that, yeah, that, that it's pretty clear from their reading that municipalities have the authority to dictate the distance. We can be more restrictive than the state, that we have the authority to do that. Um, question. Could it, be, could it be five miles apart? If we yeah. wanted it to be, it would be make uh, people angry. However, that would allow people to have <laughs> one sign on Route 1. Yeah. <laughs> or, oh, within, is it a, a radius? I think it's in a line. In, uh, okay, on the street. <laughs> interesting thought. <laughs> I mean, I I don't know. I mean, uh, it uh, you don't want to prohibit the political process, but on the other hand, it's so outrageous at this point in terms of the number of signs that litter. I, yeah, I guess I'd be concerned about. So, if you're not talking about political signs, you're talking about all temporary signs. Now you're looking at the bean supper, and if those have to be, because then you couldn't have two close to the church. Right. They'd have, uh, they'd have one. Have 500 feet. <coughs> they'd have one sign. Uh, and 500 feet up the road, they could have another sign that says, in 500 feet, turn right at the bean supper. I guess. And they could, then they could have one on the property, because we're, we're only talking about the public right of way. So yeah, this is right of way. Yeah. Right. And then the... Which leads us to the fourth question. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Uh, right yeah. of way versus private property. Um, he said, absolutely. So one of the things that I proposed to, to Bill... Absolutely what? Oh, absolutely. We can have distinct regulations for right of way versus private property. And one of the things that I suggested to Will is that... Uh, not your Will. <laughs> Bill, that... Um, Current. He, the, yeah. current, the, the current language designates, it defines temporary signs by all of these different types of sign based on content. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And so instead, we've gone through and we've struck all of that language and instead defined temporary signs by how they're placed. Wire post sign. Apparently, real estate signs, the technical term for them is a yard arm sign. Um, mm -hmm. Two post signs, and that would cover your construction site signs that meet the plywood, right? So two post sign, um, a single post sign. <coughs> thinking about the styles of signs, and then we can regulate them based on form. So if you are a two-post sign, you may not be greater than 32 square feet. That's a piece of plywood. Mm -hmm. And you may not be up for longer than X number of days in a calendar year. If you're a wire post sign, you may not be greater than six square feet. You may not be up for more than X number of weeks in a calendar year, not to exceed six weeks consecutively with two six consecutive periods not to be closer than eight weeks apart. We, there's ways and, to... And, and mm -hmm. so you could, if you said these uh, uh, realtor signs, uh, political signs, they're two by three-ish, uh, and the private property uh, schedule that we already have w could say you can have 12 square feet on uh, of those on your property. So you could have a couple of them. And so then you have to sort of say to yourself, well, what about the person who has 10 of them? Now, we were thinking that we know people who, as we went down, they, they would have the president, and then they'd have a senator, and then... Blue. Yeah. yeah. But that currently, our zoning ordinance actually prohibits that. Yeah. That and we don't enforce it now. We have a certain number of square feet in a residential zone. You're allowed to have 12 square feet of temporary signs giving notice, which we define as including political signs, and we don't enforce that now. And so yeah. it, it gets, we just have to think, but Paul said that that was a fine, he actually liked that. He's like, yes, I think that's a great way yeah. to, yeah. I, did I say Paul again? You did. Damn. Yeah. Phil, <laughs> yeah. um, he felt that that was a great way to regulate on private property and that that would solve that problem entirely. As for the right of way, I asked him, you know, we were talking about having distinct ecological or um, scenic mm -hmm. view standards as well as safety zones based on distracted driving and, and how was that was that possible? He said yes. He said to just um, make sure that you are during that conversation if we decide to go down that path. He said make sure that you're being very clear about why an area is being prohibited. Um, to really look at the Portland case that happened a couple of years ago where they tried to prohibit all signs in medians. They were trying to deal with people asking for money on median strips and they tried to do it through a sign ordinance it was struck uh, down, um, and just to kind of think about that, that if that we don't want to try to do across the board, you may not have signs at intersections, that there, there's no justification for that, <coughs> and it would not stand, but that if we did have certain intersections that for reasons of public safety, distracted driving... And that's what the Supreme Court of Maine said. Right. The, the, the city of Portland did not make a public safety argument. Right. They were making... Uh, it's a nuisance. Right. Uh, and, and they just failed to make a public safety argument. Right. Sufficiently so carry, carry the day. Phil feels that we could do that. He just said to just be really careful, document, document, document the conversation, and make sure that there's a severability clause <coughs> so that if that particular provision regarding intersections was challenged and found to be a problem, that we don't lose the whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the sensitive areas, I suspect we'd need to be very clear and delineate which ones where. But to, enough to say the marsh. I think you'd need to uh, give from this address to this address mm -hmm. or how you do that, but there needs to be a very clear standard, what is the marsh? I think yeah. from the intersection, like we've got some really great large intersection roads that would be a, a well, easily identifiable marker. Mm -hmm. um, and But he said that there's a long-standing um, precedent for protecting ecological areas against things like temporary signs, and so that that should be not a problem in any way, shape, yeah, or Yeah, I don't think that's a problem. I think the delineation can be done by just looking at a map and saying, what do we want to pick for uh, roads that are nearest to the edges of the marsh, and uh, and which marshes do we pick? And there's, you know, Black Point Road, Route One, Pine Point Road, uh, Payne Road. Payne Road. Yeah, there's, there, we just, and I think we talked last time about uh, public safety as being largely focused on Route 1, and you can you can identify those five, four, five, six intersections, uh, which are, uh, uh, I think, very legitimately restricted in terms of uh, uh, 
you just have too much, there's just way too much traffic going through those intersections to, so. So the next steps um, that Bill, that William, Bill, that, <laughs> that Councillor Donovan Will and Bill I had and discussed. Um, yeah, I'll be, yeah, yeah I'm just <laughs> illin' today. So, um, so the next steps were that um, I'll go ahead and kind of move forward in that direction as far as creating definitions for the form of the sign, you know, working with Jay and Brian in yeah. Planning and Codes to make sure that we are being respectful of the, what we currently allow, like finding, you know, with it, and we have it all broken down by zones as well, and that's completely legit. So we can say if you are in zone B1, your temporary sign limits are this number of square feet, but if you're in um, R something, then yeah. yours are this, and, and that's fine to distinguish that. And we already have that framework in place, right. so it's just a question of kind of teasing out what why it was there and how do we reflect that in this new sort of Good. so that you can be selling your house and supporting a candidate at the same time and not mm. be in violation of the ordinance. Yeah. Good. Okay. So I will work on that language. Um, then I, when I was speaking with Phil, I um, plan to send him a copy of what I had sent to Councillor Donovan, which I'm also, of course, happy to send to the rest of you. Um, once it's been updated with the additional language, He's going to look at the areas that Jay and I highlighted as, are, do we need to be concerned about this? He's going to look at the proposed language to make sure that he feels that it, it qualifies and confirm that the language that has been struck is appropriately Good. done. Is that okay? Good. Yeah, I mean, that's essential okay. that it pass muster. It's, yep. it's a tricky area. Yep. I'm hoping by May to come back to you with what really should be seen as a good first start at a final draft. Good. Perfect. Perfect. I think that's great. Uh, thanks. Good, good work on that. That's, that's Especially, I know you were under the gun helping Tom with the budget, and I was pressing you at the very end to let's make some progress on that. So mm. that was well, it was definitely a joint effort. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, agenda for, uh, so we'll uh, 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 move to carry this over to the May meeting. Second. In favor? Unanimous. Uh, and uh, the uh, May agenda? Uh, uh, Larissa had spoken to me uh, about her own interest in the importance of uh, uh, bag uh, treatment, uh, plastic bag treatment, mm -hmm. and that we would uh, uh, have her give us a little uh, uh, two cents on it now with the idea that it would be a subject for information purposes only at the May meeting. So let me just throw it to you to... Two cents. Um, it started because the state has a bill in front of it right now, that the state legislature is asking if they wish to set a goal of X number of communities by 2019 having plastic and polystyrene ordinances in effect, with that number to grow to 50 total communities by 2024 maybe, something mm. along those lines. Um, and the next week, SACO had their public hearing for their bag ordinance that they are passing. And of course, Portland and South Portland just recently had theirs. So there seems to be um, some momentum behind asking communities to consider how do they wish to deal with plastic bags and polystyrene. And it seems like where Scarborough is now sandwiched between communities that have answered that question, it may be a nice time for us to start looking at that question as well um, and seeing what the community wishes to do. Uh, if we were to have a discussion around it where we're just trying to become informed, uh, would that be something that we might want to uh, ask uh, one of our leading uh, community companies like Hannaford to, if they have a public relations person who has had to deal with that? So because Hannaford is in South Portland, they're right there at the mall. Uh, so South Portland has an ordinance. Hannaford mm, okay. has an official statement um, that they are mm. neither for nor against any plastic bag ordinances. They do not send their people to the public hearings to speak either for or against the ordinance, um, but they are happy to engage with communities that wish to work with them uh, to help with the ordinance. Um, because it'd be more, I'd like to know what the best option is. Uh, uh, and I would want Hannaford uh, as being such a good community citizen, corporate citizen, to 
to maybe offer their opinion. So. What about a retailer? Also, we can get because the little the little guys just haven't thought about it. They don't. They hmm. they figure they're under the radar. I understand many ordinances exclude retailers who have a limited square footage footprint uh, just because they're too small and because there is an element an onerous element potentially depending on what you adopt uh, it can it can be difficult so I guess I would ask do you have a sense uh, from the full council that they'll not be receptive that that, that want are you wasting your time, or yeah, is the there question something is, that are you wasting your time? I shouldn't put it that way. Uh, is there a sense that the council will be receptive to even the conversation? Uh, if I were you, I'd want to know that before you invest time and effort. And uh, maybe I should uh, put that inquiry out. It's clearly a trend that uh, is not is only going to gain momentum. There's no question about that. Falmouth is also looking at it seriously as we speak. Well. If, why, why don't we do this? Uh, if you they have it in place, they have it in place okay. for a year now. Um, if, if you would send me a, a short email that says the basis for suggesting that a discussion take place at the ordinance committee is that Saco, blah blah, so Portland, Portland, mm -hmm. Falmouth, uh, I will then send that to all the town council members and say we, as an ordinance committee would uh, be interested in learning more about this, but we don't want to do it if there's no interest on the part of the town council in pursuing it. Yeah, I, I just look to see if there's any great objections to the ordinance committee spending some time to understand the, the issues. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that might be the better way to phrase it. Yeah, exactly. I agree. Okay. So, all right, then we're good. Uh, so we have for your next agenda the Consumer Fireworks should come back to you for one last look-see. Yep. And hopefully moving it on. Uh, signs, there'll be some level of update, right? Yeah, and that'll, that'll occupy a fair amount of our time. And do you want to include plastic bag ban and polystyrene just as a discussion item so we don't lose sight? Yep. yep. So the sign is likely to be still in discussion just to kind of characterize position what the expectation is Sorry. not likely to be ready for action whereas the fireworks we expect fireworks will be in a position to right? uh, discussion and possible action okay. yep. uh, good something else that we talked about were the um, the requiring the bun bag for the horses on the beach yeah I don't know if that would be it feels like that's a small you bought some time. Their their days are limited. They might even be done. I think yeah. they're done as of March thirty first. So the uh, the idea was we were going to do it for next year. We didn't want it. So we have to have it done thing. by what's the start date? October thirty one, probably. Yeah. December November one. I think so. Yeah. So. Uh, that does seem like easy language to pull together quickly. Yeah. 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 I think that one. Uh, and if there's on that list, Tom, that you and I worked off of, yeah. if there's uh, uh -huh. fixes that. that were identified for uh, roadways, there was some. Yeah, I'll have to look back. It escapes me. But there were eight or nine mm -hmm. things that mm -hmm. we kind of jotted down quickly. Um, I just don't have it with me right now. Okay. Uh, that might be, I might suggest that's enough. Uh, if you can move the consumer fireworks on, there's still going to be many of you involved in budget, so okay, uh, it's entirely up to you how busy you want to be, but um, I'm not aware that anything... Yeah, I know, because I hate to put something on the mm -hmm. agenda, have somebody show up, and then we get to 5.30 and and we're, we're trying to, you know, out of respect for people's schedules, have an end, end time for these meetings, so... I'm sorry this one sorry, went on so long, but it was helpful. I wanted to get through everything you have been working on. I'm not sure we did. The the horse speech permit, do you want that on? or Yeah. No? I just feel like that's going to... Uh, well, so I don't know what kind of response we're going to get. I've, everyone I've spoken to has been pretty supportive of it, horse owners. And yeah. Uh, 
which is a, you Let's know, put it on, Tom. Okay. Maybe exaggerating the size uh, of that population. Uh, and and uh, as far as uh, uh, preparation for that, I would think that uh, trying to find out if uh, fun bags are suitable for all types of riders, mm -hmm. that was, I think, the, uh, yeah, the issue yeah. is that I'm going to sit back and see if anyone else wants to do the research for that. No, <laughs> it should be a complicated. I do. I Who doesn't love horses, Tom? <laughs> I've hey, never I really thought about it. Yeah. I don't have a feeling either way. Acton's kind of out in the country. We Much have lots, lots of horses. Of <laughs> and I grew up riding. I love them. Because I, I think actually that uh, uh, if they sell bun bags for um, uh, saddled horses mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to carriage, uh, then I think that's going to be a good fix. So if we could find that out as... Uh, and those are really the two variations, right? Yeah, and either you Or bareback, I suppose, but that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> Saddle right. or carriage. Yeah. What if you just... So this is... What if you're just a... What if you're a small horse owner who just likes to stroll with your horse on the beach? Just take a walk like not on its back? Right. I actually know a lot of horse, I guess we will call them stewards, who just walk their horse. They walk their horse? Huh. Never heard of uh, that. I would think if it's covered by our, our, our existing ordinance that we would extend it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we would. I mean, even if you're just walking your horse. Uh, Are you thinking saddled, free? Riderless. Riderless. We gotta, we've yeah. got to get Riderless. Oh, okay, good point, yeah. If they want to walk, and fine. They, but they just need to, they need to have that protection, and so not, they don't. You're not picking up the. I, I hear you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anything requires a big, big mitt to pick that yeah. up. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Uh, any other business? Okay. Uh, my only question there was, I, I think I recall there being some talk of coordinating with Old Orchard on that. I don't know if that was we jointly issued permit, so we ought to yeah. have the same standard. Right. Um, Perhaps Tracy and to or Tody could just reach out to your colleague in Old Orchard to see if they'd re be receptive to that. I suspect they will. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. I'm glad that. you mentioned that because we do need to uh, coordinate our effort with them. Uh, I think what would happen is everyone would end up. It'd be a de facto standard for Old Orchard Beach if we if we adopted it. Well, they could choose to do their own permit. It really it doesn't work well in practice given the contiguous beach and all. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm going to entertain, entertain a motion to adjourn. Yep. I, I move that we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Done. <laughs>